in just a moment, we'll go to prayer together. We'll lift up things that we've shared already today. We'll lift up um, things that we've known about that maybe have been passed on to us or that we've shared with others. We'll also be praying for those things that we don't know about in each other's lives. We recognize that each of us has something going on. There's good things that are happening. And maybe we don't want to boast. Or maybe we're just so busy doing other things we don't recognize the blessings around us. And just about everybody has some sort of struggle. You might say, well, hold on. If that was the worst of my problems, I'd... But each one deals with what they have. And some of these things we, we don't talk about, we don't share. But we can lift one another in prayer even without knowing those things. We don't have to wait for someone to say, I have an unspoken request. We recognize it. Everybody's got some unspoken prayer, praise or petition. And so when we join together and we pray for one another, we pray that God's Spirit, who knows all these things, hears our prayer. And according to God's will and God's ways, these prayers would be answered. We try to be careful not to tell God what to do. Not to explain to Him, here's my concern and this is how I want you to solve it. But to trust Him that He knows what's going on and He's got the better plan. And that when we see answered prayer and it doesn't look like how we would have answered that we continue to trust Him. That we don't throw up our hands and say, well I gave you a chance and now I guess I'm going to have to do this on my own, but that we trust his provision. With these ideas, let's join together in prayer. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for what you do in our lives. First and foremost, through Jesus Christ, the salvation that we know. A salvation that we could not earn, that we couldn't achieve, that we couldn't buy our way into or pray our way into, that we couldn't serve our way into, that we could not sacrifice our way into. But Jesus Christ is the way. And that he gave himself to pay our price, to redeem us, to ransom us, to buy us back from sin which held us captive. We thank you for what you do in our lives. We thank you that you continue to gift your people by your spirit. To do things that we couldn't imagine that we could do. But in your name and in your power, we can do great things. And you continue to give us gifts. Some that enter into the spotlight at times and others that nobody ever sees. Those simple things that we do that bring comfort, that bring peace, that provide a cup of cold water in your name. We ask that you continue to move in our lives and allow us the grace of touching others for you. We recognize that even in our time of prayer, this is a time of going about your work, that we pray for and with one another, that we lift up burdens, we share those who are, are dealing with, with medical testing and those who are dealing with rehabilitations. We lift up those who grieve, those who are facing work ch challenges and relationship battles, those who are lonely and heartbroken, those who are in addiction, those who are dealing with mental health with a smile on their face and turmoil at night. We pray for those things that haven't been spoken about. Those things that we we don't even want to put words to. But 
but you know. And so we lift our brothers and sisters. We lift ourselves. You know our aches and our pains, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. And we trust you with them. You know the things that go on in our minds and in our restless spirits. And we trust them to you. And we do this with confidence. We do this with boldness. Because we know that you've asked us to. We know scripture calls us to. But because we have heard the testimony. We have lived the testimony of answered prayer. Prayer answered beyond our wildest imagination. Prayer answered far from the way that we anticipated. We've known the peace. As I hymn sung, the calm assurance that comes from knowing who you are and what you've done. And so even for those things that royal us, that rile us up, that stir us, that even leave us in confusion. We trust you. We put them in your hands. According to your spirit, where there is no confusion. And we boldly pray for all of these things. Spoken, written down, unsaid, we boldly proclaim the name of Jesus in each of these situations. And we trust in your will. These things we pray in his name and his name alone. So I included in your worship packet, uh, beginning with verse 20. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in chapter 2, uh, but I do want to touch on it because it lays a lot of the groundwork for what we're going to be looking at in chapter 3. So beginning with verse 20. And again, I'll be sharing from the New International Version. That's typically what I use. If I don't use that, I try to give you that heads up, but typically. It's going to be from the NIV. Um, you're welcome to read from whatever translation uh, suits you best, or multiple translations, or have it up on your phone and, and compare two side by side to help you gain meaning. I'm all right with that. I trust that the Word of God isn't what's um, grammatically placed on a page or on a screen. It's what the Word speaks into our spirits. But if you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. And I'm going to stop there already. And you can tell if you're looking at the worship packet that I was going to stop there because I put that in bold. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Because when you know Jesus, you know the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So John says, I'm not writing to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. What John wants his readers, what John wants us to understand is that we do know the truth because we know who Jesus is. But sometimes we need to be reminded that you do know the truth. Because sometimes we live like we don't 
No. We live like we don't understand. Or we live like we know and we understand, but we're choosing something different. And John wants to remind us that once we start choosing something different, once we start choosing something other than truth, we choose lies. And he wants to remind us here, second part of verse 21, no lie comes from the truth. He's kind of calling us out. He's not kind of calling us out. He is calling us out. He's reminding us that we know what to do. We just make choices about whether or not we're going to do it. We know what to live. We know what to, to implement in our lives. But we make choices. And we have to come to the the reality that if it's not the truth in Jesus, then it's not the truth. Verse 22, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And you say, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not denying Jesus. We claim his name. We talk about him. We come to church. And John's getting at this idea that if you know that Jesus is the truth and you do something different, by your actions, you're denying him and you're proving yourself to be a liar. That hurts a little bit. Because I think we all recognize there are times that we have done things that we know are not the things of Jesus. And that makes us out to be liars. I think it's why so many folks, not only outside the church, but even inside the church, kind of look at Christians. Look at the church, little c, capital C, church with a degree of skepticism because we have a track record of being liars of saying oh I follow Jesus but then doing something that even folks who don't know much about Jesus say I can't believe that that's what your Jesus is calling you to And so we recognize that while John paints in a broad stroke, whoever denies Jesus, such a person is the Antichrist. Well, obviously we're not the Antichrist. But we recognize ourselves in it. That when we don't live the truth, we give the lie. And that is Antichrist. So a little bit of a warning here. He goes on, verse 24, As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If you've known the truth, and again, that beginning is the beginning of the understanding of the truth. Not those things that you heard before you were exposed to the truth, but now that you know the truth, what you've heard from the very beginning, let it remain in you. Be reminded that you are a sinner without recourse. That you have fallen away from God, sometimes accidentally, sometimes boldly, deliberately in rebellion, sometimes carelessly and out of neglect. You've been separated from God. And the truth is that in Without Jesus Christ, we can't get back. But Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. What you heard from the beginning, make sure it remains in you. Remember that. There's a humility that is involved in taking Jesus as our Savior. 
We cannot do that with arrogance. We cannot do that proclaiming that we're right. Proclaiming how much we know and how much we understand. We have to come in humility, in brokenness, recognizing as that song we learned in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, Jesus loves me, this I know. I'm weak, but he is strong. When we start coming in saying, well, I'm strong, but I can use a little something. I'm strong, but I can take some assistance. We have to come in weak and say, I'm helpless. I can do nothing. So what John's telling us is what you've heard from the beginning. See that it remains in you. That even in our maturity, we recognize I am weak, but he is strong. And yes, Jesus loves me. If it does, this is the continuing verse 24, if it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. This is what he promised us. Eternal life, the way, the truth, the life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. He wants to remind us that there are forces in our lives. There are those who have agendas, who want us to move away from the truth. And sometimes, Sometimes they sound so good. They sound so right. Sometimes those forces just seem to make so much sense because they kind of align with how I've really been feeling all along. We start to realize that the reason we like their agenda so much is that it's often what our agenda has been. Maybe our hidden agenda. Maybe we haven't wanted to, to speak it, we wanted to, haven't wanted to share it because we knew that it kind of goes against what we know to be true in Jesus. But darn it, I kind of feel this way. And so we start to hear voices that speak to what we want that start to explain that, you know, your perspective, maybe it doesn't seem to line up with it, but we can tell you how this in fact is true. Because doesn't it just make sense? And we get led astray. And John is warning us of that. And he's warning us that not, not, not from the outside world, but from within the church, from within the body of believers, from within those who claim the name of Jesus, that there are some who are not living in the truth. Because they have chosen something that sounds good, that feels good, with the lines, with the way that they just think must be right. And John wants to warn us to be careful listening to those voices. Even if it's the pastor standing in the pulpit. To be careful and listen to see if it lines up with what we know to be true in Jesus Christ. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches, his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. When there's an outside force, and that outside force can be someone you trust very much, it can be somebody in your own family, it can certainly be an outside source from the media, from an organization, when it starts 
teaching things that don't seem to line up with what the Spirit has taught you, and you've got to choose which is the truth, stay in Him. Stay in the truth that you've known, what you've heard from the beginning. Let it remain in you as you remain in Him. If it pulls you away from those things, Question, challenge, wrestle with it. And now, dear children, and don't you love it when John uses language like that? Now, dear children, he's not yelling at us. He's correcting like a loving parent. Now, dear children, continue in him. When you've got a choice and you're not sure, remain with the truth. Continue with Him so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. I wonder how many times we make decisions and we choose. I wanted to say path. We choose a path. But I want to make it even simpler than that. We choose words. Words that we speak aloud. Words that we pass on in social media. Words that we retweet. I wonder how many times we choose those words. And if we thought about it and thought about Jesus standing next to us as we said them, then we thought, read that text chain we sent. Would we be confident? Or would we be ashamed? If we continue in Him, we want to know that everything we do, He would be pleased with. And it's easy to kind of lose that perspective. It's easy to kind of drift away from that. And that's what John is warning about here. That we have choices and sometimes it's just teeny tiny little derivations, little deviations that, that step us gradually away. That we drift. And we don't even realize it. First John concludes with, If you know that he is righteous, you know that, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. There's a fruit. And the fruit of being born in him is that right living. Doing what is right. And that leads us directly into 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. We are reborn of Him, and we become His children. We are no longer children of the world. We are no longer children of darkness and of sin. We are children of light and of truth, of forgiveness. Maybe some of you have sung that verse. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. I love the NIV version there of lavished on us. Not just kind of handed out, hey, that's nice, that's nice, but lavished, extravagant. Extravagant love that we should be called children of God, not subjects of God, not mere followers of God, but children of God. And that is what we are. Exclamation point. We're children of God. Kind of read between the lines is now act. Like it. Now he goes on to explain that not everybody is on the same page. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. In other words, people don't always recognize the truth of what we do because they don't recognize what truth is. They don't recognize the truth. I mean, you've perhaps taken a philosophy course at some point. And this idea of trying to ascertain what is truth. We recognize that truth is Jesus Christ. Folks who, by their philosophy, find some other equation to get to what truth is, can't always comprehend who we are or what we are. Because it doesn't fit their framework. And perhaps a framework that we have left behind. Perhaps a framework that some folks are trying to get us back into. Which is why he has to say, I'm writing to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. They're trying to tell you that truth isn't what you think truth is. The truth is what you make it. Truth is what you want it to be. Truth is truth at any given moment, but not necessarily the same moment the next time. The same truth the next moment. The reason the world does not know you, know us, is that it did not know him. So we should expect that not everybody is going to accept truth as we proclaim it in the name of Jesus. Because they just don't understand where we're coming from. And that's sometimes a hard thing for us. But we have to appreciate that we didn't always know the truth. Oh, we thought we knew a truth. We thought we understood what was true. But then we heard the truth of Jesus. And now we have to choose for that to remain in us. Verse 2, dear friends. Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. See, now we're children of God, but what's that ultimately going to look like? We don't know yet. But we know this with confidence we're children of God. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. A recognition that we have to be careful not to claim that we know everything. We know the one who knows everything. And there will come a time where things will be revealed to us. But until then, we rely on what we know. What we know is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the truth. Now we are children of God, and what we will be is not yet been made known, but what we know. But what we know that we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Are we like him now? Eh. We are Christ-like, but we're not Christ-like. We try to be more like him. We try to walk in that truth. We know we haven't attained. All of it. Now, we're not going to attain being God. We're children of God, but we won't become God. We won't become Jesus, but we will be like Him. And we will see Him as He is. I mean, isn't that incredible? That what we know about Jesus, all that we know and how great He is, that this isn't all of it. There's more to come. To recognize the joy of living for Christ is just the beginning of the joy that will be when we live fully in Christ. So in the meantime, we stick with what we know and as we know. And we have to be honest. We don't know all. Verse 3, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. When we have this hope in him, not this wishy-washy hope, but this bold, confident hope, 
that there will come a time when he will be revealed, that everything will be made known, and then we will be completely who we should be in him. That this is a means of purifying ourselves. It helps us get rid of some of that other stuff, some of that influence that comes in, that drifting away. We realign ourselves with him. We're children of God. We know that. We're not sure how that's going to play out exactly on the other side, but we are confident in Him. And we choose to stay on this path, to choose this course. Others might want to tell us something different, but we choose the truth. Now it goes on here. And this, this, well, this is going to sting a little bit, I think. Everyone who sins breaks the law. I'm sorry, breaks the law. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. You kind of grasp that point, right? That it's doing things that are against what we're supposed to be doing. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. He has no sin of his own. And there can't be sin in him. We know that that's part of his perfect nature. That he can't be tainted. Verse 3, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. He is pure. In him is no sin. And we're in him. Because we trust in Him. We've accepted His salvation for our sins. And it would be nice if this stopped here. But verse 6 says, No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. I'm not going to ask for people to raise their hands. But I'm going to guess if I did, Somebody might raise their hand if I said, has anyone here ever sinned after coming to know who Jesus is? I'm going to guess a hand or two might go up on that. So, uh-oh. No one who lives on him keeps on, lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So what does that mean for any of us who might have raised our hands on that question? Does it mean that we don't know him? Because we surely have sinned since that moment, that recognition. So what do we do with this? It would be so much easier if John didn't put that. Because we could be kind of bold in our confidence that, that in Him, I am sinless. But we know we sin. But maybe, maybe the theme here isn't that occasional moment when we blow it. Sometimes, boldly, actively, defiantly sinning. Saying, I know this is what I should do, but this I'm going to do. I know it's right here, but I'm choosing something different. Because this situation calls for something different. I mean, I think that's still sin. And I think it's wrong. But I don't think it's what's being talked about here. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. I think what's talking about here is that, that um, active application of sin. Saying, I know this is a sin. I know it's been a sin. I'm going to remain in this sin. I'm going to keep on doing this. I'm going to do it out of habit. I'm going to do it out of convenience. I'm going to do it out of... I, I just don't think there's any other way. I think this 
is what he's talking about when he talks about let the truth remain in us. When we say, you know what, I know that in all these areas of my life this is true, but over here, I just have to go against that. You know, if you understood my circumstances, I'm going to continue this path. This isn't a one-off. This is a continuing theme in this sin. I mean, Paul talks about sin, doesn't he? The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Fancy church talk, we talk about sins of omission and things, sins of commission. The things that we omit and the things that we commit. Paul certainly understood that as a follower of Jesus, that he still sinned. But he understood that he wasn't trying to make a habit of sin. He recognized sin for what it was, felt that remorse. I think Paul could hear these words of John and say, no, I, I remain in the truth. I just mess up sometimes. But when we start to say, I know what the truth is, and I just... I've got to do it this way. I'm going to live in that lane. I think that's what John's talking about. Do you really know the truth then? Have you really chosen the truth then? Or have you only chosen the truths that are convenient and then in those inconvenient places find some other truths because they fit your agenda? If that's the case, John's saying, I don't think you knew the truth. Because you can't have it both ways. No, no one who lives in him keeps on, keeps on sinning, keeps that record, keeps that connection. No one who continues to sin, again, continues, has either seen him or known him. Now, do not hear me say, as long as it's not a pattern, the occasional sin isn't too bad. That's not what I'm saying. Sin is sin. But there's that recognition that that ongoing, continuing habit of sin might make you question whether or not you really know the truth. Dear children, loving that, do not let anyone lead you astray. I mean, he fits this in right after talking about someone who keeps on singing. Sin, probably because John recognizes there are some forces that have tried to convince you that this, this habit, this track over here, this lane you're in, it's not really sin. It's okay. Oh, it doesn't look like that truth, but it's a version of the truth. It's a shade of the truth. It's truth like truth ish john says don't let them lead you astray don't let them lead you into that pattern of continual habitual sin that this becomes a lifestyle choice that this becomes a decision that you make that i'm going to live in this way that's not the one-off like paul's talking about So he puts it right there, recognizing that we're susceptible to that. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now, that seems to be self-explanatory. The one who does what is right is righteous. What he's saying, he's talking about actions. You can say, well, I'm righteous because of what God has done, but now I'm going to live this way. My righteousness is okay. But I'm going to be over here where I know it's sin. And John's saying, you can't do that. If you're righteous, you're going to do the things that are right. If you say I'm righteous, but I'm going to do wrong, you kind of got led astray. You didn't remain in the truth that you knew to be the truth. See, we recognize that we all have choices. We choose how to interact in different situations. 
We choose how to interact, how to react. We choose how to be proactive. We make these choices all along that spectrum. And if we want to be in the truth, we choose the right things. Now we don't let anybody kind of sweet talk us and half convince us that what is wrong is in fact right. Even if that person stands in the pulpit. Even if they've got a great podcast. Or a TV show that comes on cable and reaches a large audience. We have to be careful not to be led away from the truth by half-truths and partial truths. Your children do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is sinful in the devil, sorry, is sinful, is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. If you choose to do the things that are sinful, you choose to do the things of the devil, you're not choosing to do the things of Jesus. It's kind of a simple equation. When confronted with a choice, what do you do? I want to share with you some of the lyrics from a, a song that I don't know how many of you would know. It, it, uh, a country singer, uh, Thomas Rhett, sang it. And it really, uh, it, it played when there was a lot of other stuff going on in the world. You might have missed it. It actually got to number two on, on country radio, country airplay. It was released in March of 2020. March 30th. Do you remember March of 2020? Pandemic. Bit of craziness. Thomas Ray had written this earlier, but he chose to release it at that point. And, and released it. It wasn't on an album or something. He released it because he said, this, this needs to get out there at this moment. And it was about choices. And I... I love the beginning because it kind of has an Ecclesiastes 3 vibe to it. In a time full of war, be peace. And March 30th, 2020, but it certainly could have been a line for today's headlines, couldn't it? In a time full of war, be peace. In a time full of doubt, just believe. Yeah, there ain't that much difference between you and me. In a time full of war, be peace. That we always have a choice to make. What are we going to choose? In a world full of hate, you don't have to read many headlines before you start seeing hate. You don't have to read many social media posts before you start hearing hate. You don't have to listen to a whole lot of news programs until you hear hate. In a world full of hate, be a light. That's the name of the song, Be a Light. In a world full of hate, be a light. When you do somebody wrong, make it right. Recognition that it's not just all the wrongs that other people are doing, that we are involved in. And that part of being a light is recognizing when we've been the one who's been wrong. And make it right. Don't hide in the dark. You were born to shine. In a world full of hate, be a light. I mean, I said the first part kind of reminded me of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This, this one reminds me of another song you might have learned in Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
We know a dark world, but we have the light. We know a world full of hate. We know the light. We know the Prince of Peace. We have a light to shine. We choose that. I mean, that's what that, that song you sang in Sunday school, that was about making choice, wasn't it? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to make a choice. Do you say the part about hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. When a world is full of wrong, choose right. That's the, the chorus of that song. In a world full of hate, be a light. When you do something wrong, make it right. Don't hide in the dark. You were born to shine. In a world full of hate, be a light. In a place that needs change, make a difference. In a time full of noise, just listen. Because life is but a breeze. Better live it. In a place that needs a change, make a difference. And like a lot of songs, that chorus gets repeated a couple of times. And it ends with this. Yeah, it's hard to live in color when you just see black and white in a world full of hate. Be a light. One of the challenges that we have that leads us to a world of doubt, a world of war, a world full of hate, is seeing things in black and white. It's what I believe versus what you believe. And if you don't believe what I believe, then that's where war comes in, that's where hate comes in, that's where darkness comes in. And part of think of our going astray, being led off the track, is when we start letting these other voices tell us, this over here is truth. And if people aren't on this page, there you're in. And we see the truth of being children of God. That everyone sins. And that no one group has the in versus another. And the only way, the only truth, the only life is through Jesus. And we start letting something else substitute for that. When we start creating ways to make ourselves superior to the other, we stop doing what's right. We stop being a light. We stop shining the truth of Jesus. And we get on that track that leads us away from truth. Oh, it doesn't have to be radical. I mean, that's... I loved geometry when I was in school because it was like puzzle making, puzzle solving, and things balance. Also, that's also why I like chemistry, balancing the equations kind of thing. It doesn't take much of a degree being off. At the beginning, it doesn't look like much. But down the long stretch, it does. I don't know if anybody's ever put tile on a floor. Anybody's ever put tiling on a floor? And you thought your lines were straight. They looked real good when you started. But once you go over a distance, that little bit of that eighth of an inch down here is three inches down there. And see, that's how folks move us off track. It seems so close. It's close enough. It's almost the truth. 
But the further we go, the further we get removed from what is true. And we stop being peace in the world. We stop being light. We stop making the right difference. Well, we make a difference, but we're moving folks away from truth instead of towards it. I think that's what John's warning us about. Be careful of the voices you listen to and what they claim to be true. I think it's easy for all of us to kind of get in that way that just seems to make sense to us. And if folks don't agree with us, well, then they just, they must be wrong. And how dangerous it becomes when we start to make those decisions and say, well, because I'm a Christian and I have that name and I know what's right, you must not be a Christian. And how often we do that inside the church. That as believers, we take sides. And we start to get our position entrenched because we are convinced that ours is the only right answer in that situation. And so there's folks that won't, won't worship in that church or won't follow that teaching because so-and-so, well, you know who they are, you know what they do, so that can't be right. And there are Christian brothers and sisters who cut each other off. Because they start seeing, well, I'm right and you're wrong, and so I have to get away from you. And it's not that simple. There are those that want to lead us astray. And we've got to listen to what those voices say and compare them to what Jesus says. And we do know a world that's full of war. A world that's full of hate. And are we going to add to it? Or are we going to help make it right? Are we going to help be a light? Are we going to shine in it? Are we going to be peace? Are we going to do what is right? The one who does what is right is righteous. And your righteous indignation might not have much to do with it. No one who is, verse 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Again, that continuing theme, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. want to save the best for last, and I think John did it there. Easy, all the way through there, to look at who this is being preached at, who John's talking to, who John's setting right, because you know what? I know who's off the track. I know which person is not remaining where they should be. I know who's fallen for some other truth. get to that very last line. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. We've started to put up walls. We've started to put up barriers. We've started to make it reasons why we don't have to love that other person in the church because they're not doing things right. I know that they're the one that's off track. And we do that not only in the church local, the church small C, but the church universal, the big C church. When we start saying, well, those people who call themselves Jesus but worship like this or do that or have that practice. Those who promote this or allow that. Well, they're not my brother and sister. They're the ones that are clearly wrong. 
I think John would warn us right here. When we start deciding who's right and wrong and separating from brothers and sisters, anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. When we start saying, well, because I know what rally you went to, because I know whose bumper sticker you have on your car, because I know what so-and-so in your family said, you are no longer part of me. Then the question becomes, are we really God's child that we can hate? I mean, that's what does not love means that we can start to hate our brother and sister, that we can other our fellow Christians. Now, maybe we need to start looking for that log and find out what I is really in. In a world full of hate, be a light. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that you gave us the light that we can know what is true. That we can know what is good. We thank you that Jesus is for us the way and the truth. Forgive us for when those times when we've lost our way. When we've rejected truth. When we have continued in sin. Allow us to wrestle with these things. Allow us to see these words of John as a mirror for ourselves, not a window to look out on the rest of the world. Let it be for us a call to contrition, to humility. Let it be a reminder to us that he is the light of the world. And we're called to bear that light in the dark places. Help us to do what is right. Help us to be a light. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 264, Thine is the Glory. I invite you to stand if you care to as we sing together, Thine is the Glory.
through that email concerning uh, funeral arrangements that were discussed earlier and some addresses. Uh, a reminder, if anybody would like to adopt home plants, I've got two up here that are looking for a good home. <clears throat> Again, thanks for being with us. We'll continue in 1 John next week. I hope you can join us again. As you go, go with this benediction. Go. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. Going in the truth that you know. Remain in that truth. In that truth, be a light as he is a light. Share your light with the dark world. Go into that world. Be a blessing. And in him, be blessed. Amen.